Good evening, everyone. I'm Maggie Howell from the Wolf Conservation Center, and I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's webinar, Howling at the Moon, A History of Werewolves. While scary stories and mythologies are filled with mentions of werewolves, what do we really know about them? What are the truths behind werewolves and their origins? And do they have anything to do with real wolves? With us tonight, we're excited to have Craig Thompson who will help us answer some of these questions as he takes us on a deep dive through the history, legends, and traditions associated with the werewolf. Craig is a PhD researcher from Beerbeck uh, University of London, whose research interests include horror Gothic literature, monster theory, and folklorist folkloristics. Folkloristics. Oh, sorry about that. Um, his current research focuses on werewolves, folklore, and popular culture within British and Irish Gothic literature from the late 19th century to early 20th century. So before we dig in, just a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during Craig's presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in the control panel, and we'll address them at the end of tonight's presentation. Also, we will have a recorded version of this webinar up on our website within a day or so, so uh, you can watch it as many times as you'd like. I think that's it. So now we're going to turn the time over to Craig. Thanks for being here, Craig. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you for having me. So, um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying the Halloween season. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you all for coming. I suppose that's the first thing to say. Um, it's really great to hear so many people coming along and um, I'm looking forward to sharing what I hope will be a really, really interesting talk for many of you. Um, I'd also like to just do a quick shout out to the Wolf Conservation Centre for inviting me here to talk with you. Um, the guys here do some really important and inspiring work teaching people about wolves, um, as well as educating people as to our role in ensuring these amazing animals remain protected. Um, it's amazing to see and I've learned a lot just from kind of going over the website and things. So again, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm just, I'm just glad to be able to kind of help support the work that you guys do. So um, as Maggie said, my name is Craig Thompson. I'm a current postgraduate researcher at Birkbeck University of London, um, which is one of the UK's leading research institutions and actually specialises in evening learning, which is quite appropriate considering it's around about 11 o'clock at night here in the UK. Um, but also considering the topic of this evening's talk. Um, my background is particularly in English literature, where I specialise in folklore, gothic fiction and um, popular culture. Um, and my research is particularly focused on the rise of the werewolf as a kind of key figure within Victorian horror fiction. And so the talk I'm going to deliver here today really focuses on the history of the werewolf tradition, particularly in both the United States and in Europe. Um, I'm going to discuss what werewolves are, what um, beliefs are often associated with the creature, and how these can appear much more complicated than they first appear. I'll also discuss potential theories as to the origins of such beliefs, as well as several early accounts of werewolves as seen in both classical mythology, folklore, and even early literature. I'll then go into how the werewolf evolves over time, appearing as a figure of sympathy within medieval writing, before becoming more closely associated with things like witchcraft in the early modern period. And I'll also show how the werewolf's popularity dwindles for a time before eventually becoming revived in the Victorian period and how this eventually feeds into the 20th century, which would ultimately act as a catalyst for what we can regard as the kind of default incarnation of the creature and how this has in turn influenced how many of us today see the werewolf. And then following that, hopefully that will come to the end and I should hopefully have some time to have some questions from you all. Um, but that'll be, you know, towards the end of the talk. So without further ado, um, what is a werewolf? Um, what are the common ideas that we have when we normally think about werewolves? It's something that might seem very easy on the surface, but it becomes a lot more complicated when you begin to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so to, to begin with, I thought it might be worth kind of um, seeing what you guys think of when you think about werewolves. What are the type of things that you would normally consider um, kind of being linked to the werewolf? And I, I think you could just, if there's anything you could put, maybe just put in the chat, I'm thinking, 
Um, anything regarding like the rules of a werewolf, any weaknesses, any ways you might become a werewolf, just anything like that. Um, and then I hopefully I can see a few already now. Very, very quick, guys. Um, yeah. Wolf Spain, the full moon, silver bullets. Wow, this is coming in quick. Yeah, human wolf hybrid wolf skin. That's a very good one, guys. Shapeshifter. Yeah, brilliant. Very good. I mean, yeah, so a lot of these things are absolutely brilliant. Some of them, you guys, you know, you're experts in yourself, really, with some of the stuff. Great at basketball. I love it. Yeah, Team Wolf reference there, guys. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I think these are all kind of very um, common associations that we have when we think about the werewolf, particularly here in the Western world. Um, to put it simply, um, I've picked out a quote from um, a writer named Matthew Beresford. Um, and I think he very kind of nicely sums up what can be described as the popular understanding of the beast. And he states that in the popular law, it is said that a man is transformed into a werewolf on the night of a full moon. As he undergoes the physical change into the beast, he is beset by murderous urges. A silver bullet would be the only way to stop the man beast from killing. So what Beresford describes here are some of the popular characteristics of the werewolf. Um, but as you guys have mentioned, there's very, there's loads of different kind of um, facets of this. You include, you know, you could also include the transfer of the curse through either a bite or a scratch, the pentagram, even Wolf's Bane, um, good at basketball, all of these different things that have kind of um, become linked to the werewolf tradition. Um, so while this might seem very straightforward at first, it becomes a whole lot more complicated when you begin to really study the werewolf particularly in relation to the many traditional stories that are associated with the beast. What also becomes clear is that many of these ideas and concepts that we normally associate with our popular idea of the werewolf largely come from more modern sources, such as film, television, and even things like books and comic books. More than this, as many critics such as Sam George, Bill Hughes, and Kadja Frank have stated, and if anybody's really, really interested in werewolves, these guys and Sam George, Bill Hughes, and Kadja Frank, they're really kind of like the world experts, um, world kind of leading experts in werewolf studies. And I would really recommend they've got a project called the Open Graves Open Minds Project. And if you're if you really want to kind of look into this in even more detail, I would definitely suggest you look at their stuff. But they claim that there is not just one universalized version of the beast. It rarely stays the same in different countries and is often bundled together with other traditions relating to other were beasts or shapeshifters. And this is one of the things I want to kind of show tonight is that while we may have our own basic understanding of what we think werewolves are, it's actually a little bit more complicated than we initially think. So I suppose one question we might all, kind of all ask well, or, or kind of have is where do werewolves come from? Where does this belief in werewolves or people that transform into wolves actually originate? And what's clear is that the werewolf appears as a very common tradition, appearing across Europe, Asia, um, Africa, um, and the Americas. And one common denominator across many of these regions is the appearance of the wolf, um, very appropriate considering the hosts of today's talk. Um, and the, obviously, as we know, the wolf's habitat was once far more reaching than it is today. So for many critics, the werewolf superstition appears more readily in regions where wolves were far more common. Of course, the truth is, is it's very much, pretty much impossible to actually decipher where these traditions actually originate. But it hasn't stopped historians, anthropologists, and even early folklorists from coming up with their own theories as to the um, creature's origin. Um, some of the early um, historical accounts, such as those by um, Caroline Taylor Stewart, link the belief in werewolves to that of early hunting societies. The theory goes that upon seeing wolves survive and take down larger prey in the wild, that kind of um, these societies would be seen to ponder how to harness the power, uh, power of these animals for their own interests. And this would lead to a number of things, such as the domestication of dogs, um, but also the, even the use of furs for warmth. And Stuart further claims that within many of these societies, the wolf would often be used as a kind of totem, with hunters um, seeking to mirror the qualities of the wolf to use them to their own advantage. In this sense, many of these societies sought to imitate the wolf as a way of channeling the attributes of the creatures that they had seen in the wild. While many of these theories as put forward by writers like Stuart attempt to identify an early origin for the werewolf tradition, um, 
The werewolf would also appear in many of the earliest examples of mythology. In fact, one of the earliest written examples of the werewolf would be in that of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is an epic poem from ancient Mesopotamia that was written around the second millennium BC. And you can see that in that stone tablet at the far end of this slide, on the right hand side, sorry. Um, within this story, Gilgamesh, um, the, the hero of the tale, rejects the advances of a goddess named Ishtar due to her ill treatment of her former lovers. And it's specifically in relation to that of a loyal shepherd who after offering sacrifices to Ishtar is transformed by the goddess into a wolf. And that in turn causes his, his own shepherd boys to chase him away and his dogs to then bite at his haunches. Um, Greek mythology would also um, have its own kind of werewolf with the story of Lycaon, which was popularized in Ovid's Metamorphosis. Um, Lycaon was an Arcadian king who would famously be transformed into a wolf as punishment by the god Zeus after he tricked him into eating human flesh. Um, and while Adam Douglas claims that the Lycaon myth's most obvious purpose is to express a taboo against the eating of human flesh, what has further been speculated is that the very origins of this tale is drawn from many of the kind of ritual ceremonies and sacrifices that were found in Arcadia in ancient Greece. Not only were many of these rituals often speculated as being put forward by the Arcadians to protect their flocks, flocks from wolf attacks, but the Roman writer Pliny the Elder would write of an Arcadian tradition that involved members of various clans casting lots. And then the chosen member of these lots would then transform into a wolf for nine years after he hung his clothes um, on a branch and swam across a, um, a marsh. And if during that time, those, that nine year period, he had refrained from touching a human being, i.e. eating anybody, he would return across the marsh and return to human form only nine years older. I think what's interesting about this tale is that Pliny discredits the story, not so much due to the fact that a person could transform into a wolf, but rather that he found it very hard to believe that a subject's clothes could stay in place for one for nine years and not be removed. So it, as funny as it is, it, while we may have this belief in werewolves and um, that it was a given thing that they were, you know, kind of tangible material threats in the past, Pliny shows that even then the beast was seen as a superstition or a folk tale. And Greece would not be the only country with werewolves crafted into its classical mythology. Um, in ancient Rome, the common usage of the Latin term versipellis or, or turnskin would become the term used to describe werewolves. Um, and it would also become linked to the belief that um, werewolves, when they're in the human forms, were marked by having hair growing on the insides of their bodies. And that if you were to actually cut a werewolf when they were in human form, there would actually be fur underneath. Um, another early text from Rome would be the Satyricon by um, Petronius, which would feature its own werewolf tale in which a character named Miseros relates the time he was walking with a friend under the light of the moon. Um, as they're walking, his friend physically transforms into a wolf um, and is later kind of um, seen attacking um, a group of shepherds. Um, and he later kind of returns back. And then when it should be said, he, he kind of flees after he stabbed this wolf. Um, and then a few kind of, um, the, 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 the story goes on, he later relates him and finds his, the human form of this character, but he's got the same wound that was stab, that the stab wound that the wolf had. Strangely, um, this story, it's very old, but it would appear to popularize several aspects of the legend that would become popular with modern audiences, including the motif of the moon, but also, as I mentioned, this idea of the sympathetic wound. And it's the idea that if you harm a werewolf whilst they're in their wolf form, the same wound will still be visible once they transform back into a human. The text would also, it should be said, introduce a couple of items that would be less common um, in later centuries, um, such as the idea that the person um, is able to transform into a wolf by taking off their clothes, putting them in a pile, and then urinating around them where they turn to stone. Um, understandably, I can't think why that bit didn't really catch on as much. Um, other early examples of the werewolf myth would be seen in early Scandinavia as well. Um, the Norse text Volsunga Saga would feature the characters of Sigimund and Sinfjolti, who were able to um, physically shapeshift into wolves via the use of wolf skins. Alongside this, the figure of the berserker, which was likely translated um, um, as bear shirts from Sweden, 
Um, these would appear as warriors who wore bear pelts and coats into battle. And it was possibly speculated that they did this similar to the kind of older hunting societies uh, as, as a way of channeling their patron animals ferocity. And you can see that in this kind of, again, in the picture on the right, this, this figure here with the kind of bear's head. It's the idea that they're wearing the, um, the, the bear pelt to kind of channel the bear's power. Um, and they would even have their, within these ranks, there would be um, their own kind of sub-faction, that of the Ulfednar, um, which were the wolf-rocked. And these were people that wore wolf skins instead of bear pelts. Of course, um, these are only a selection of the early incarnations and theories associated with the werewolf. There are many more out there. We just simply don't have the time to list them. We'd be here all night. Um, but nevertheless, across all these examples, we can see not only a number of theories regarding the origin of werewolf traditions and superstitions, but also how they begin to differ across different times and in different countries, particularly in the ancient world. And this trend would continue as time went on. Um, while the ancient world would um, uh, help form many of the conflicting and numerous traditions associated with the werewolf, the medieval and later early modern age would become regarded as two key periods in the development of the werewolf. In Britain particularly, not only would the very term werewolf begin to come into fashion, but the wolf itself would be perceived as a key element in the werewolf's development. While wolves had roamed the countryside of Britain alongside man for centuries, it would be in the early modern, um, sorry, early medieval world that would begin to perceive the wolf as that of a pest or a killer of livestock, a change that Barry Lopez describes as coinciding with mankind's movement from that of a hunting society to one of agriculture and animal husbandry. Um, the early Saxons would actually name um, January um, Wolf Month um, and, the um, and the wolf itself would be seen as a, a kind of um, a form of currency, as it were. Um, Sam George and Bill Hughes explained that dead wolves were often coveted as trophies um, in Anglo-Saxon Britain. And King Edgar demanded that his Welsh subjects would pay him 300 wolf skins a year. Um, additionally, criminals were often ordered to pay their specific debts using wolf tongues. And wolves were not seen, not only seen as dangerous to livestock and cattle, but they were also seen as dangerous to people um, within the med medieval um, age. Battlefields were often found to be the hunting grounds for wolves, while special danger hospitals were set up in, in England for the protection of travellers, with wider parts of the country seen as being particularly um, infested with these animals. With the perceived danger of the wolf, the period would see rigorous measures taken to eradicate them here in Britain, not only would tributes of wolf furs be paid to the king, but the Normans would offer grants of land on the condition that they were kept clear of wolves. Alongside this, the rising influence of Christianity would have further influence on attitudes relating to the wolf. Just as um, cultural attitudes of the time associated the wolf as, as a pest, um, Christianity mirrored such attitudes by symbolically recasting the wolf as the devil in relation to its depiction of Christ as the lamb. This would in turn manifest within the traditions associated with the werewolf. Um, as Barry Lopez writes, it was no coincidence that simultaneously there was a drive to wipe the wolf out of Europe while the werewolf is being revitalized as tearing around the countryside on the devil's business. In fact, the very first recorded usage of the term werewolf within literature would appear in the 11th century with the ecclesial ordinances of King Canute where it would become imbued with biblical meaning, a um, warning of a ravening werewolf that might widely devastate nor bite so many of the spiritual flock. This early usage would set the tone for what would become a common association within the medieval period, with the creature becoming increasingly associated with um, the devil, essentially. While the very term werewolf may be linked to the literature of the Anglo-Saxon period, the extinction of the wolf within the British Isles would, would itself have a profound effect on the werewolf as a figure of folklore here in the UK. By being seen as a, th a threat or a pest, the animal quickly became an endangered species, and, and, um, a, which would sadly lead to its um, eventual eradication during the 16th century, which was enforced by legislation introduced by Henry VII. Um, the 
19th century writer, Sabine Baring Gould, um, who actually wrote a book called The Book of Werewolves, which would become hugely influential for later histories of the werewolf and would even influence Bram Stoker when he wrote his uh, magnum opus Dracula. But he would note that English folklore is singularly barren of werewolf stories. The reason being that wolves had been extirpated from England under the Anglo-Saxon kings and therefore ceased to be objects of dread to the people. The traditional belief in werewolfism must, however, have remained long in the popular mind, though at present it has disappeared for the word occurs in old ballads and romances. For Baring Gould, the extermination of such creatures is the reason as to why werewolf mythology is rarely seen here in the British Isles and particularly England. But as Baring Gould notes, the popularity of the werewolf myth would allow for it to appear in many of the romances that would be seen as part of the werewolf renaissance of the 12th century. Um, while the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the slide to change, there we go. While the Christian demonization of the wolf would grow to become a more important part of the beast's textual makeup within the later um, 13th century, the creature's earliest appearances within these medieval romances was largely one of what Adam Douglas describes as a mild amusement or a curiosity. And one of the most famous stories to introduce the werewolf would be the Lay of Biche Claveret by um, Marie de France, a um, French writer who lived in Northern England during the 12th century. Um, and the story follows this renowned knight named Biche Claveret, who is forced into transforming into a wolf for three days of every week. Um, Upon uncovering his curse, this knight's wife betrays him in that she sends her lover to remove his clothes from the knight's hiding place, thus trapping him in his wolf form. A year later, the knight, now imprisoned within his wolf form, is eventually taken in by the king of the land, um, who, who sees a kind of, um, kind of noble intelligence in the beast. And later, when he's taken to court, he identifies his wife and her lover and attacks them something that causes suspicion in the king because it's never happened before. The king elects to question them both under torture, as you would, because it's medieval, you know, um, and learns that they had each stolen the knight's clothes. Once they return to him, the knight eventually returns to his human form and has his lands returned to him, while his treacherous wife and her lover are banished. Um, de Fran while de France would describe the werewolf as a ferocious beast, her work most notably here presents a kind of sympathetic interpretation of the werewolf, one that is seeking revenge, but simply to be returned to his human form. More interestingly, though, this is a very different werewolf from what we're used to today, um, a creature whose curse is seemingly inherited, who can only return to human form once returning to his clothes and who is forced into it for three days of the week. I mean, that's probably why his wife wanted to leave him, to be honest. Um, De France's depiction would be accompanied by a whole host of other werewolf romances. Other works such as Arthur and Gorlagan would feature the legendary figure of King Arthur um, and would follow a very, very similar structure to Bish Claveret by presenting another depiction of the werewolf, this time as a king who again is wronged by a treacherous wife, this time through the cutting of a magical plant, um, who then becomes the favourite of another king in a foreign land and eventually regains his form as well as his revenge. Um, so you can see that they're, they're both very, very similar in structure, almost similar tales in a way. Yet while many appear sympathetic in these early tales, this would begin to change over time as attitudes, particularly towards kind of older um, pagan um, beliefs and more traditional um, beliefs, were increasingly seen as intolerable to Christianity. Um, Whereas previous, I love this photo, by the way, it just looks like the werewolves are just kind of having a cigarette break. I just, it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, whereas previous Roman religions had sought to integrate the religious beliefs of indigenous people within their pantheon of gods, Catholicism would take a very different approach and instead sought to diabolize all pre-Christian beliefs by aligning them with the devil. Yet whether people believed um, man could physically transform into wolves was very much up for debate. Um, in the medieval period, writers such as Giraldus um, had argued that only God had the divine power to transform men into wolves, um, while writers such as St. Augustine would theorize as to what he would describe as the doctrine of metamorphosis, in that it was believed that man's kind of unconscious energy 
could confuse people into believing they had transformed by almost like physically manifesting their belief. This would again change in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, following the Malleus Maleficarum by um, Jacob Sprenger and Heinrich Kramer, which has been alluded to of having started kickstarting the witch craze that swept Europe, there would be several notable demonologies and early scholarly treaties um, that would be published which included werewolves. While writers such as Jean Bodin would, would cement the werewolf as a very real and credible threat to man, um, the majority of others such as Henry Bouget would argue that man was not able to transform into a wolf, but rather that witches were being tricked by the devil into believing that they had transformed, with the devil then taking the form of the wolf himself and then um, going about his business, causing chaos, and then any injuries or anything that he sustained as a wolf, he would then transfer onto the witch. Needless to say, as you can see with these examples, the belief in werewolves and whether man could actually transform into wolves was still very much up for debate even at this time. Yet despite this, the influence of such demonologies would ensure that the werewolf would become increasingly linked to the figure of the witch. No longer seen as amusements and thus largely kind of extradited from popular literature, in the years that followed, the link between witchcraft and the werewolf would become further solidified by what would be infamously known as the werewolf trials of the period, um, which were part of the werewolf craze that swept the European continent and saw a number of people um, sadly executed as werewolves. Among the most notable cases would be that of Gil Garnier, a um, reclusive hermit from France who in 1573 admitted to killing and eating several children whilst in the shape of a wolf. After a group of peasants saved a young girl from a large wolf, he and his wife were soon arrested by the local populace where he testified under torture, it should be said, many of these confessions were done under torture, that's how they managed to get them to confess to being werewolves, um, where he confessed under that and um, he was eventually burned at the stake. Um, in Germany, you'd also have the case of Peter Stube, who was known as the werewolf of Cologne, which would be an equally infamous tale. Um, he was convicted and executed in 1589, where he again confessed under torture that the devil had given him a girdle, which allowed him to transform into a wolf and roam the countryside, eating an unknown number of people and animals. The notoriety of these stories would prove influential on the continent and were often spread through pamphlets and local gossip. They would popularize not only the link between the werewolf, um, the werewolf and the devil, but also the use of salves, girdles and wolf belts. And I, I saw a few, a few of them mentioned in the chat. Um, as methods of transforming into wolves. Again, a far cry from popular modern understanding of how people transform into werewolves. Um, for many historians of the werewolf trials though, these cases would change with the case of um, Jean Grenier, who was a young boy who claimed to have transformed into a wolf after receiving a wolf belt and salve from a dark stranger. After the court ruled that the boy was actually unwell um, rather than the natural werewolf, the idea of werewolves came to be regarded as something that required treatment, not punishment. And this would start what would become a common association between lycanthropy and psychology. You will know I've not really used the term lycanthropy in this. It's more a clinical term today. So I've, I've tried to really focus on the idea of werewolves as a more supernatural element. I should say, though, the link between psychology and werewolfism is incredibly vast. Um, there's a whole kind of literature on this. Um, it's probably worth an entire talk in itself. So I won't venture too far into it here, but if anybody is interested in it, please send me an email and I'm sure I can send over some, um, some reading on it because it is really interesting um, and there's so much written on it. Um, despite these appearances, um, however, and aside from a kind of smattering of appearances in, in demonologies and non-fictional histories, the werewolf would appear relatively rare within um, popular literature following the medieval romances. While the wolf itself would appear as a kind of stock villain of fairy tales and stories, the emergence of the Enlightenment and particularly its focus on reason would mean that superstitions such as the werewolf wouldn't be properly, um, properly kind of revived, I suppose, until the mid to late 19th century, where a rising interest in folklore and popular Gothic fiction would help rejuvenate the werewolf as a popular literary figure. Um, the period would also see um, many scientific debates surrounding the link between man and animals, 
brought upon by the work of Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution, as well as others such as Ernest Haeckel. And the werewolf here would become a perfect vessel for exploring fears relating to degeneration and the link between beast and man. The idea that instead of going forward with evolution, you could go backwards as well. Um, aside from a few kind of rare examples, the first truly notable appearance of the werewolf following the medieval romances would be at the turn of the 19th century within Charles Maturin's um, 1824 novel, The Albigenesis. Um, set within a medieval past, evocative of many of those kind of previous medieval romances, um, the creature would have only a fleeting appearance within the um, story um, when the novel's hero, Sir Palador, encounters a prisoner that's suffering from lycanthropy within a castle dungeon. Um, the Albigenesis would not be the only one of these early werewolf tales to set their plots within past settings. Um, Richard Thompson's 1828 story, The Werewolf, A Legend of the Limousine, would also follow in the path of many of those um, early medieval romances, with its focus on a wrongly disgraced knight, um, who is again, after being betrayed by his friend this time, um, is banished by, by his king, um, and he eventually returns as a werewolf to claim his revenge on his betrayer. Um, the story should be noted, I think, for several innovations, particularly the notion that the curse might be passed on via a bite or a scratch. And this is something that would become key to many kind of more modern werewolf stories. I should say in this tale, it's not actually explicit whether this is actually the case. It's only hinted um, at as one of the characters kind of paranoid ravings about werewolves, um, but it definitely sets the seed for that as a, um, an actual kind of characteristic of the werewolf. Um, as the century continued, many writers would continue to move on and develop the werewolf story away from this focus on the medieval past. Um, originally published as part of the 1839 novel, The Phantom Ship, um, Frederick Marriott's The White Wolf of the Hearts Mountains would follow a sailor named Krantz who recounts how his father fled his homeland after, again, murdering his adulterous wife um, and settles in the Hearts Mountains with his children. Surviving as a farmer and a hunter, Krantz's family soon encounter two travellers, a father and a daughter. And Krantz's father offers them shelter from the winter and they eventually, he eventually begins to fall in love with the daughter, Christina, who he eventually marries. Um, the children soon discover that their new stepmother is a werewolf. And after two of them are actually killed, Krantz and his father are forced to kill Christina, who um, upon dying is revealed to be a wolf as she feeds on the graves um, of the children. It should be said that this idea of werewolves um, feeding on graves and appearing in graveyards is not new by any, by any stretch of the means. This is something that goes back to the medieval period. And I believe it comes from the actual, from actually wolves uh, uh, appearing as scavengers. I think it's kind of that, it come, perhaps comes from that belief. But Marriott's story is an important one in the literary history of the werewolf in that according to Brian J. Frost, it established a pattern for werewolf stories for the remainder of the 19th century, most notably presenting them as kind of white-furred, um, violent, femme fatale she-wolves. And while the idea of the female and white werewolf has long been evident within oral traditions associated with the werewolf, um, such tales would signal um, the transformation of the werewolf as a literary figure, moving it away from being the kind of tragic, sympathetic outsider of the medieval romances to an often malevolent, manipulative, and, and ultimately disruptive antagonist who, is, um, of, who often brought danger to that of very conservative Victorian values. And such a trope would be seen within later texts, such as Gilbert Campbell's The White Wolf of Costoption, which acts as a kind of weird ripoff of um, Marriott's tale. I actually really enjoy it. I think it's a really kind of um, streamlined story. I think it's, it's quite pulpy, but it does read as a bit of a ripoff of Marriott's story. Um, and then there would also be Clemens Hausmann's The, the Werewolf, which was, um, has become a kind of regarded as a classic of the genre. And within both these tales, the, the female she werewolves are often violent, bloodthirsty, and often wear white furs in a, in a manner reminiscent of the girdles and wolf frocks of previous generations. Um, another popular werewolf tale um, from the period would be that of George Reynolds's Wagner the Werewolf, which was published as a popular weekly serial during the mid 19th century. Within what is um, quite a sprawling tale, um, the story follows the character of Fernand Wagner, um, an old hermit who makes a pact with Faust that offers him eternal youth, intelligence and wealth on the condition 
that he um, also has to turn into a werewolf at sunset on the last day of every month. Um, who would do that? I don't know. It's up there. Um, while Reynolds's story is notable um, for being, as Frost describes, the first novel to have a werewolf as its principal character, it is also a story in which the werewolf appears surprisingly little. Um, the story appears actually more focused on um, Wagner's love interest, Nisidia, as well as a, a variety of subplots, including the Inquisition, um, a group of nuns, um, and the politics of the Ottoman Empire. There's a lot in this novel, um, and um, yeah, not a lot of it really to do with werewolves, unfortunately. Um, but despite this, Reynolds would be credited, according to theories such as Chantal Bougart de Coudray, as developing what can be described as the horror of the transformation scene. And you see this within werewolf media. It's the idea that the, that the text takes specific emphasis on the grotesque physical transformation of the beast. You see it in werewolf films all the time. And it's something that would become integral to many kind of visual werewolf media, particularly when we look at comic books and films. It's very much key to those type of um, stories. And alongside the popularization of the transformation sequence, um, Reynolds' tale would also revamp several of the werewolf's characteristics and would even invent new ones for his novel. Um, drawing upon the link between the werewolf and the devil, the curse appears to be that of a Faustian bargain and one that happens on the last day of every month. And additionally, rather than it being either a silver bullet or the return of one's clothing, Reynolds adds a highly elaborate method by which the werewolf might be freed of his curse. Um, after struggling with the devil, Wagner is eventually told that his curse may only be broken upon seeing the bleached skeletons of two innocent victims suspended um, to the same beam. So basically he had to see two skeletons that were innocent hung from a beam like they were hung. Um, yeah, you can kind of see again why this very elaborate um, solution didn't really again catch on. Um, but needless to say, a lot happens in this novel and this actually happens at the end of the novel. Um, and he um, eventually just crumbles to dust, a bit like Dorian Gray. Um, although Reynolds may have kind of popularized the transformation sequence, um, as we've just kind of seen, many of the additions um, that he would come up with are, are, are largely minimal in influence. And um, particularly, as I said, the novel just sadly isn't really that good, unfortunately. Um, but despite this, Reynolds's work is important. It demonstrates an early example of how writers sought to kind of adapt and often simplify um, some of the complex characteristics of the werewolf for audiences. And the werewolf would continue to grow in popularity during this period. Um, at the end of the century, you'd see writers such as Rudyard Kipling, Arthur Conan Doyle, and again, Bram Stoker and Dracula. And Kasia Frank writes a really brilliant book chapter on how Dracula can be read as a werewolf. And it's an absolute, if, if anybody's interested, again, just feel free to email me and I'll send you um, where you can find it because it's a really, really fascinating um, article. But they would all get in, all of these writers would get involved in the werewolf's resurgence. Um, in fact, actually, um, for many critics, um, including the novelist Stephen King, um, they've made the argument that Robert Louis Stevenson's strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde stands as one of the most popular werewolf stories of the period. I myself don't necessarily agree with it, but um, I think it's, there's, there's definitely an argument there for that, potentially. Um, while the 19th century would get the ball rolling on the werewolf tale, it would experience a decline um, in the early decades of the 20th century as, as horror stories were being largely surpassed by other genres, such as the detective tale. Um, while the odd story would still appear in Pulp Fiction, it would be with the advent of cinema that the werewolf would return um, and in turn establish many of the popular characteristics that we associate with the creature. Um, this would begin in 1935's um, Werewolf of London. So if anybody hasn't seen um, Werewolf of London, I wouldn't worry because not many people did really when it came out. Um, Whilst this was not the first werewolf film, it was the first in black and white with sound and was largely produced to cash in on the success of previous monster films such as Dracula and Frankenstein. So I'll go through a very brief summary of the film. Um, it follows this main character of Dr. Glendon who travels to Tibet in order to source this mysterious plant that only blooms in the moonlight. Whilst there, he's attacked by a werewolf and bitten, but he manages to fight it off and he returns home to London. Um, whilst you know, whilst there, he's told by this scientist named um, Dr. Yagami 
that anybody bitten by a werewolf will turn into one by the light of the full moon and that the plant is the only cure. Needless to say, Glendon eventually transforms into a wolf um, by the light of the full moon and chaos ensues um, with him eventually being shot in his wolf form. Sorry, sorry for the spoilers. Um, so this film immediately stands as something of a foundational moment within the history of the popular werewolf in that we begin to see several characteristics um, appear that would become very common to the kind of um, to the associate or the popular kind of conception of the werewolf to mainstream audiences. Firstly, there's the inclusion of the bite, the idea that the curse is transferred via the bite of another werewolf. And this is something that's become increasingly popular within many mainstream understandings of the werewolf. As I mentioned, there had been instances where this had appeared previously, uh, most notably Richard Thompson's um, short story, but this is the first to very much kind of explicitly popularize this view. Secondly, there's also the idea of the werewolf being transformed by the light of the full moon. In this film, it's linked to this mysterious flower, which is also the um, antidote to the curse. Um, again, while werewolves had often transformed at night, as in, say, the Satyricon, um, th and I believe there's actually stories of full moons in, in parts of Italy as well. Um, this is one of the first films to essentially establish the full moon as the key activation for the transformation. And finally, the film would also signal the rise in popularity of the depiction of the werewolf as a kind of anthropomorphic man-wolf hybrid, um, as you can see in the screen caps. Um, and this is an image that would become increasingly popular as the 20th century went on. Um, again, I, I don't believe this is the first time it was done. I've actually seen political posters from, I believe it's the late 19th century that have this kind of depiction, but it did help popularize this, this image of the, the werewolf as a kind of wolf man. Um, Despite the kind of popularity of such items, Werewolf of London would ultimately be a disappointment for Universal. Um, and the result would leave the werewolf in limbo for around six years until the um, studio would revitalize it in the 1941 film, The Wolfman, which um, would be a much bigger success. And, and I would argue stands as perhaps the quintessential werewolf story. Um, so again, I'll summarize. Um, the film follows a man named Larry Talbot, who returns home to his in, um, ancestral home of Wales and is greeted with local legends of the werewolf. I find it quite funny, actually, that it's set in Wales, because, as I mentioned, Britain um, has very, very minimal werewolf folklore. There's not much there. I think the effect was that um, they set it in the kind of the old world and, you know, it's, it's, it's Europe. It, it kind of sets it away from the modern world in a way. So I think that was what the, the screenwriter was trying to get by doing that. But again, it's strange in that there's very little werewolf um, folklore um, in that, that, that part of the world. Um, anyway, um, one night Larry is attacked by a wolf, which he manages to kill with a silver headed cane. And he later learns that the wolf that attacked him was a local, a local man. Um, that as he survived the attack, um, he will transform when the wolf's bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. And as before in the, in, in, in the previous film, Larry again transforms into a werewolf and is eventually killed by his father with the same silver cane that was used to kill the first werewolf. The Wolfman therefore seeks to kind of streamline many of what had been established and within Werewolf of London. Not only does the film's makeup again double down on this kind of hybrid man-wolf aesthetic for the beast, um, but the film also shows the werewolf curse as being transmitted through a bite or scratch with the subsequent transformation then being activated by the moon. It should be noted that in this first film, it is the autumn moon, but this is quickly retconned in the film's sequels to become full moon. And I think this was again, largely for simplicity. It was also kind of easier, I suppose, for them to, to um, kind of visually represent the full moon on screen um, rather than that of an autumn moon. And I think it feels a lot more kind of mythic or, or operatic in doing so. Um, while other items are added, um, most notably the pentagram as the symbol of the beast, um, wolfsbane as another element of the werewolf's transformation, there are other elements that are removed, most notably the um, supernatural flower that was found in Werewolf of London. Um, yet perhaps the most important contribution to the popular werewolf myth would be the use of silver as a key weapon for combating the beast. Um, while silver had previously been used within earlier werewolf stories and legends, um, most notably Baring Gould um, writes in the Book of Werewolves that it's a, it's a weakness to shapeshifters, um, The Wolfman would be the film that popularises this concept as a key method of dispatching the creature. 
I should note that the famous silver bullet, while it's mentioned in this film, would actually only appear for um, several films down the line in the 1944 sequel, House of Frankenstein. So the Wolfman therefore appears to simplify and streamline um, many of the elements previously picked up from Werewolf of London and consolidates them into what would become a hugely influential depiction of the werewolf. Um, what's more impressive, for me anyway, is the how influential this presentation has been to, to the popular understanding of the beast. Um, by presenting much of the attributes as, as folklore or old traditional legend, um, the film's writer was able to pass off his interpretation of the werewolf as actual authentic folklore. And I should say that the effect was so potent that many believed it to be exactly that and something that amused um, the writer. And I think it's still today, a lot of people still associate um, many of the characteristics that were popularised by this film as actual um, folklore for the werewolf. So I'm just going to kind of bring this um, session to a close um, in a minute, but in the years that followed, many um, modern kind of cinematic and literary depictions of the werewolf would draw heavily from Universal's effective streamlining of the werewolf's properties. Um, and the Wolfman, in this sense, I would argue, works as a kind of key generating text for the beast, similar to how um, Stoker's Dracula works for the vampire. Um, and the influence of Universal's films can be seen in texts such as Stephen King's Cycle of the Werewolf, um, John Landis's An American Werewolf in London, um, and Charlene Harris's um, Southern Vampire Mysteries, um, which would each use the full moon as a key method of activating the werewolf's transformation. Um, just as others, such as Gary Brandner's The Howling, would use silver as a key method of killing the beast. Of course, um, to say that all incarnations of the werewolf would follow this would be completely inaccurate. As we have shown, the werewolf is incredibly versatile. Um, and there would also be different takes on the werewolf that would reject many of these um, tropes. Um, in Whitley Stryber's The Wolfen, for instance, the wolfen um, are simply reconfigured as a separate species from that of man that preys on humans. Um, while in Mar Marvel's and Werewolf by Night comics, the werewolf curse is instead passed down as a kind of ancient um, ancestral curse that is passed on through the generations and is very much linked to Marvel's kind of ongoing mythology. To put it simply then, the werewolf is still changing even today. And I'd like to think what I've been able to show you here is how these creatures very rarely appear the same and that many of the popular characteristics we associate with the werewolf arise from popular culture, particularly film. I'm kind of reminded of something that John Landis, um, the director of an American werewolf in London once said. He asked his son, how do you kill a vampire? To which his son answered the usual steak through the heart, garlic, etc. Um, to which he replied, and I'm shortening this because there was a lot of expletives involved. Um, he said, no, you can kill a vampire however you want because vampires don't exist. And as silly as this is, it's very much this idea that I think resonates when you look at the history of the werewolf. Very rarely do werewolves appear to be the same. And I suppose this is what has allowed the creature to continue to stay relevant and interest audiences and readers from across the globe. In fact, um, just this month, Marvel have just released a television adaption of their comic Werewolf by Night, um, to much acclaim. It's very good, actually. If anybody's got an hour spare, I'd definitely recommend looking at it. It's shot in, mostly in black and white. It's just really fun. Um, and there's also going to be a remake of The Wolfman um, set to star um, Ryan Gosling. I believe that's in production at the moment. So um, whether we like it, the werewolf is here to stay. Um, whether it, and whether it be by the light of the full moon, the use of wolf coats, or simply as family inheritance, um, it's not going anywhere. And as I've shown, it, silver bullets may or may not be the only things that can stop it. Um, so at this point, I think um, I'd like, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for listening. It's been, I, I can't, I'm kind of completely blown over by the amount of people that have um, come um, and signed up. Um, and I'm looking forward to any questions. So um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll open the floor up now. If, if um, Maggie, do you want to take over? Yes, thank you so much, Craig. Um, I'm kind of blown away by how many people um, <laughs> know so much about werewolves, actually, <laughs> um, in the chat. So uh, this has been really fun, and uh, I've learned a lot. But um, just for the people who uh, might have joined a bit late, um, we are here with Craig Thompson, and he just finished his presentation about really the history of werewolves. 
And um, if you do have questions, if you could just put them in the Q&A panel or the Q&A box in the panel, and, um, and that's where we can find them. Uh, the chat is just way too crazy for us to be able to find <laughs> questions in there. Um, and so let's see, there's one I thought was pretty interesting. By the way, we have um, over 50 questions right now. We're not going to be able to get through all of them, but we will just try to jump around and try to um, pick randomly so it's fair. Yeah. Guys, um, if, you've got, if you've got anything, please feel free to just contact me. Um, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to always chat werewolves. So yeah, anything, if there's anything that I that we don't get to, feel free to send me some anything. Yes, and actually, why don't you, um, Craig, put your email then in the chat because I think I a lot of these that. questions close with that that uh, request. Yeah. Um, so where, hold on. Oh, this is interesting. Um, are there any theories as to why um, werewolves kind of caught on versus some other animal, um, other predator like were bears or were tigers? I think it was in True Blood they had were yeah. something that wasn't wolves. I don't remember what it was, but um, but otherwise yeah. I've really never heard about it. Yeah, I, I believe it it comes down to the commonality of the wolf really. Um, it, I, as I mentioned, wolves have have this kind of wide habitat and they did previously um and i think that's probably why there's more where there's more werewolves and where tigers and other things um as i say they used to be like as you mentioned, kim just mentioned there they, they used to be so many different places so um yeah i think that is the reason why werewolves have caught on a lot more um people can kind of um see these things as um like more, more, they're more linked to their kind of habitat and their their, their culture, and it's interesting because what's also quite interesting is although I mentioned that werewolf um, traditions are quite rare in the UK, um, as we're seeing more kind of like movies and things, people are claiming to see werewolves here more in the UK now, and there there, there are there are the odd folkloric kind of tradition there, but um. um yeah, it, I think that's purely it. I think it's more to do with the commonality of the wolf itself, which means that the werewolf is, has kind of been able to catch on. And um, as I said, it, it really re is revived in the Victorian period. People are fascinated by folklore, by Gothic fiction, and um, they just really, really loved, um, you know, werewolves fit that perfectly. So I think that was why they kind of got revived during that time. And that's really what my interest kind of that's where my research focuses focuses on. Yeah, and and there have been some questions here about how you did um, kind of fall into this field or, or follow this field, and, and and what really motivated you. So um, I started. I'm just putting my um, email address in. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I started actually. Um, my well, I, I started. Do, I did an MA on monsters. I was. I'm, I'm fascinated by monsters and what how they can um reflect cultural um anxieties um, sometimes cultural desires i'm really really fascinated by what how we use monsters as symbols for things um and i originally <laughs> i did my my ma was actually on the the monster godzilla believe it or not and it was on eco criticism it was on how the monster can be can be related wow. to the environment. Um, but as I kind of did more reading, um, I, I originally did was going to do an entire thesis on eco criticism, but then I just got really fascinated by the werewolf, and particularly um, Sabine Baring Gould's *The Book of Werewolves*. And from there, that I've just kind of I, we realised it's it's there's there is a kind of burgeoning um, kind of scholar scholarship associated with the werewolf, as I mentioned the. Open Greg's Open Minds are doing some absolutely amazing stuff, um, and I would always recommend that you look there. Um, but um, they're normally like displaced in favor of the vampire. The vampire is a lot more kind of sexy and common. So people prefer that. Um, so the werewolf kind of is the you know the kind of kind of forgotten about a little bit. So there's a little bit. There's going to be more, there's more from that. There's going to be more werewolf um, scholarship coming. There definitely is. Um, but yeah, I found that, yeah, I think that's, yeah, um, that's kind of where I'm coming at. It's just to kind of look at this from a different, different angle. And I'm focused on, let's say, more of the Victorian period. 
why why does it become popular there it's just um it's it's amazing because for years they're just this they just disappear and then they just sprout up again i just find that really i, I don't know why um <laughs> i'm still getting to the bottom of that i think i know why but i'm not 100 <laughs> percent. well when i told my teenage daughter about what you do she was blown away and i think she now has a uh, a new goal for a career path <laughs> <laughs> Um, like, and actually, like, when I was, <laughs> and there's some questions here, and, and my daughter actually mentioned this too, um, about she learned or heard that there was a connection um, to rabies, and maybe that was something going on. And before you answer that, sorry, I just have to figure out a way to get all these questions in. Um, there's another question that's kind of related to what might have been causing the werewolf craze of the 16th century. And um, and this person asks uh, if it was, where is it? Oh, related to a high level of um, ergot growth on grains yeah. and hallucinations. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different theories as to why these things, I think there was also mercury. Um, they believe that um, many, like going back as far as the, the kind of like um, the Roman period, I believe, they believe that wolfsbane um, could, and, and things could, could create, they, they were almost like hallucinogenics. So people, there, there is there is a lot of kind of scholarship on that um, stuff. Um, so yeah, no, that is that's very much in there. That there, there were these beliefs that people were kind of hallucinating whether they could be um, werewolves. Um, I think there, there's there's a lot kind of um, well, they're um, I think I think they're valid in in that they're in, they're very interesting. Obviously, the the historical. Um, research is very difficult sometimes to actually validate but um it definitely makes for an interesting reading there's a lot on that um there's loads of other ones um to do with to do with that um but yeah no it's just it's very interesting all these different things um regarding like poisoning hallucinogenics and, and all that kind of stuff um and how I, I suppose it was how people tried to make sense of the world that's i suppose that's what monsters are aren't they they're they're ways that we try mm. and particularly in the olden days, tried to make sense of the world around us when there were things going on that sometimes we couldn't quite understand or comprehend. No, that makes sense. Um, okay, this person's asking, and, and I noticed this as well, um, but has there been any studying of the link between werewolves and the vilification of women? Yes, yes. Um, um, there's a great... Um, Oh, there's, there's a there's a book called She Wolves and it's a cultural history of the female world. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated in that period where that trope um, of the kind of um, the white kind of white wolf, um, she wolf becomes really popular. It almost sets up a um, kind of it, as I said, it, it almost sets up a a a kind of subgenre in itself of the werewolf werewolf genre in that there's all these stories that follow that same kind of pattern um there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there um there's a lot of re kind of writing on it um again if anybody's interested i could i can get reading lists for stuff that i've used in the past because there are some amazing um stuff out there but yeah um there's a lot where it's um I, I'm always interested as well is this kind of ongoing um, kind of thing that was, as I said, as I was re, re, kind of going through these historical texts, is that, 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 that thing of why is it that within all these stories that when the werewolf appears, why is it always the adulterous wife? Why is it always um, like, why is that a thing? And it, it's really, really common. Um, I can't quite put my, my finger on it. I think it's to do with a kind of reinforcing, particularly in the medieval period, I think it's very much um, a kind of a way in which they could can control and put forward their own kind of hegemonic um, values. So it was very much keeping those kind of conservative, um, male-dominated patriarchal values. And I suppose that's what the werewolf kind of kind of links into in the victorian period um it's very much the female werewolf is generally seen um in some cases as in the white wolf of costoption and um the white wolf of the hearts minds as a real danger it's this idea that the, that that women 
um, were at the time, particularly in the Victorian period, were um, getting more freedoms. And Victorian men were generally were, were quite scared of that. They, they didn't really understand it and were, were generally quite terrified. So the werewolf in this sense becomes a, a, a kind of um, an exercise in, in male anxiety to an extent um, of, of female gender roles. But what's interesting about the werewolf by Clement Hausman, which is one of my, my favorite stories, is it's almost a response to that. Um, Clemens Hausmann was a suffragette um, and a, you know, a, a, a feminist writer who um, she essentially presents the werewolf as somebody that's um, actually to be applauded to an extent. Um, and actually the, the, the main protagonist of the tale could actually be seen as the, the almost, um, almost the, 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 the almost the antagonist actually you might say he's the one that's causing the aggressor in the situation um and it's it, it could it can be seen as a comment on um kind of society at the time a kind of veiled comment that isn't done explicitly um it's a fascinating story and one that i would again would recommend um i recommend both tales just because they're really really kind of fun to, they're fun to compare against one another but yeah, that, that's that's what I would say regarding that. Oh, I have a feeling you're going to have to <laughs> have a whole book list and and people are still asking for your email. <laughs> um, this is interesting. Someone's asking what you know of the Wolver legend from the Shetland Islands of Scotland, <laughs> said to be a werewolf-like creature living in a region who are said to have lived in caves and were mostly peaceful towards humans. Yes. Um, I didn't include these. I had them actually in the um, presentation um, for a short period, but I took them out. The reason being is um, there's <laughs> sometimes when you bring them up, people go, they're not werewolves because they don't turn into wolves and, you know, they don't turn into men and they don't do anything like that. So that, so a lot of them are like, no, they're not werewolves. You can't include wolves. Like, I suppose you could do the same with the wolf, you know, the, the wolfen from um, um, the wolfen book as well. It's kind of similar. Um, I, I, yeah, they're, they're quite fun. I, I like that one because it's not how you um, imagine where, well, how we perceive werewolves um, today as kind of ferocious monsters that are just bloodthirsty. These guys are benevolent. And I think they, I believe they, um, uh, they give out like fishes and things. So they, they, they help people, which I quite like this idea. And whenever you see like fantasy art of them, they're always like kind of hunky looking wolf dudes. So um, it's uh, a, <laughs> It's always quite funny to see that. But yeah, no, I, I know of the war, but I nearly included it. But um, um, yeah, I um, didn't. Um, I didn't for that reason. I thought I didn't want to get pulled up on a technicality. <laughs> I, I was but it was I was nearly, you know, I nearly in trouble for putting in the, uh, the wolf. And so I thought I could maybe just get that one past. Let's see. There was someone else. I'm trying to find where it is now. Um, but uh, they were asking again about a specific kind of um, creature. Um, I believe it was in the southeast, and it was called the Ruggaroo. Um, oh yeah. I can't find the question, but um, what do you know about that? Um, I know a little bit about that. Um, they're based, um, I believe, around New Orleans. Um, the the I think it's the Rougarou. I could be wrong though. Um, oh, my my ac my ac my accents, you know, not 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 great for this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, Louisiana. So um, yeah, I believe they're more to they're kind of linked to um, things like um, I believe they've almost got like a voodoo practice to them. I could be wrong, but they've got that kind of link link to that. Um, yeah. I don't know really. I must admit that's one area that I'm kind of, um, yeah. Luke Garou is another one. Yeah. Rue Gat Rue. There we go. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that um, because I, I mainly focus on Victorian and, and British kind of focus, Mm -hmm. with, with my research I don't really look at it but I'm always fascinated when I hear more about these things um again there's some really really great kind of um art and a lot of kind of um work on those um creatures and how they how they're actually a lot of their legends but um yeah I find them I find them really interesting and they've got a lot more of a, um, a more sinister edge um, I think people are really interested in dark folklore at the moment like people really really enjoy it at the moment i think it's because it's kind of a escape from 
the world. I mean, <laughs> here in the UK, our, our um, government's slowly being destroyed today. So, um, yeah, everybody's kind of, um, I think it's just a great escape, kind of escape. Yeah, the Loop Guru um, does have its relates in France. In fact, um, in Sabine Barr and Gould's um, book of werewolves, his the, like the first um, chapter and the introduction actually, he talks about how he mentioned um, how he's he he was in France actually. Um, I think I believe it's I can't remember. I think it's part of Brittany, um, and he's taught he's speaking with some locals about werewolves and they call the loop guru and they, they say yeah you can't go out on into that field at night because that's where they are and if you go out into that field you will get attacked by a loop guru so he's actually and he's a really fascinating guy Sabine Barangul because he's kind of this 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 guy who is a folklorist who's retelling the tales and he acts as though you know he, he's relating what he's heard um never kind of um accurately it's always just i remember it this way um so he writes you actually relates of a story he was told in person about um werewolves um in the um or loop guru you know that that tradition so yeah it's that's a really interesting part um it's literally in the first introduction of um of the werewolf uh, of, the, of the book of werewolves yeah and and actually and preparing for this webinar, I was looking for um, just some resources and Book of Werewolves is actually in podcast form. <laughs> so if anyone yeah. wants to just have a listen, um, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, some, a lot of questions about kind of modern day, uh, how they're portrayed in culture and how you feel about that. And, you know, things like Harry Potter, um, trying to look at the exact questions, but also there were some questions about where you think the werewolf is going. Like, <laughs> you know, however, you know, our culture or politics or, yeah. or what have you shapes um, these shapeshifters. Um, what do you think is gonna happen moving forward? I um, do not want to answer that question. <laughs> um, to, 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 I mean, what I suppose the key thing for me is that the werewolf is not limited by how we understand it. Um, the werewolf is not, as I mentioned, it's not a universal thing. It changes depending on which kind of um, kind of which culture it's in relation to and who's telling it. And much of what we understand as werewolf folklore, as we said, as we've just discussed, it comes from the modern day. And I think that's absolutely um, fascinating. Um, where they're going, um, I don't know, but it'll be fun, won't it, when we go and see all the different <laughs> places. Um, I, I just I just love all of the, you know, I love all the multifaceted elements of, of the werewolf. Um, I, I was going to say one of my most my, my favorite modern um, werewolf stories is Ginger Snaps, but um, I didn't want to. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's I, I think that might be old now because it's yeah, I think that was in the 90s. Um, but yeah, that is definitely one of my favorite um, contemporary werewolf stories. And that's all about kind of um, female empowerment. Lots of particularly particularly following the, the wolf man in the 60s and 70s you'd get a lot of talk about um werewolves as a metaphor for um teenagers and things and and the, and actually the um werewolf of london has a really horrible kind of xenophobic connotation if you, if you actually look at the film it's it's not very nice at all but so they've always been linked to um politics if you look at it in that sense um but yeah my contemporary werewolves um i'm trying to think of other ones there's a great actually there's a really really great um it's kind of a novel it's more like a free verse poem called sharp teeth by toby barlow i would definitely recommend that if anybody's read it it makes a comment on kind of um kind of um the, the la sort of subcultures there it's a really really brilliant book um definitely worth a read um and you can read it in like a day because it's so quick and so so well written um i would definitely recommend that one if, if if anybody's interested um it's really interesting excellent and lastly because just want to let everyone who's on know that it is 
past midnight where you are <laughs> <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Um, but uh, have you written anything and do you plan to? Yeah, um, so currently I've got a piece that will be um, appearing in a, well, it, it, it's soon to be released um, coming forward. I can't really reveal too much on it, but it is on folklore. Um, I've got a book chapter on that. Um, and that is actually on um, the Wolfman and Werewolf of London. Um, and I've got a few other more irons in the fire. There's a couple of them. Um, bits and pieces that I've got um, due to it. I'm, I'm still, as I say, I'm currently um, midway through my um, PhD on werewolves. Um, and um, yeah, I've got a couple of things in the, in, in, in the fire. Um, I'll make sure um, if people are following me and, and keep in touch that um, uh, I let people know when, when they'll be out. But um, yeah, that's um, what I'll be, um, will, will be doing. Um, as I say, I can't really give away too much at the moment because <laughs> they're still in the editing, they're in the editing phase. Well, we can know to be on the lookout. And just for everyone, because um, I know there's a lot of people want a lot of follow up and, and um, they're really interested in this. Um, you can find uh, your website. Is that that's monstrousfolklore.com, correct? Yeah, mo monstrousfolklore.com. Um, it's my research website. Um, it's purely, you know, to do even, yeah, oh, there's, there's one there. Yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch with me um, via that way, um, there's a, I think, I believe I've got my email address on there anyway. Um, you can additionally get me on Twitter at craigieboyt. Um, um, and I'll, I'll put in my email again because <laughs> I'll put it in about three. Um, why not? Um, yeah, no and people... answering email tonight, tomorrow. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. I've got the, the week. I've got the week off, so um, it's okay. I can I can look at it there. Um, hopefully that will work there. Um, but yeah, no, it's been it. Honestly, it's been great, and I, I'm honestly blown over by the amount of people that have turned up. Um, and all the questions have been really you guys you guys should have done this presentation not me <laughs> <laughs> when the, when, when I saw um, wolves um, wolf's pelts being mentioned wolf pelts I was like whoa these guys are clued up so yeah um, absolutely brilliant really um, well, we'll have to check in with you um, in the future when you can reveal some more of your secrets yeah definitely definitely um, it, it's been an absolute pleasure um, and even though, you know, this is, unfortunately, it's not a full moon, it would have been great, but it is Werewolf Wednesday. So, um, well, it, well yes. it, was where, it was Werewolf Wednesday, it's not now. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, again, go to um, monstrousfolklore.com and Craigie you, Boy, right, Craigie Boy T. Do Twitter. you want me just to, before I do it, I'll, I'll let me share my um, screen in there. Perfect. People, everyone take a screen there. Shot. There you go, guys. And that's got all of my details there. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Craig. This has been so much fun. And honestly, just, just a nice kind of change uh, and a no, great no. way to kind of celebrate the season. So really appreciate it. And, no, and um, yeah, no, thank you for having me. And it's honestly, it's been great. And some of this, I've, I've been really like inspired by seeing some of the work you guys do as well. I believe they're introducing the wolves here back into the UK as well, up in Scotland. So um, yeah, I, I'm actually Scottish myself. So seeing those, you know, that hopefully will will come to pass and, and, you know, hopefully make progress on that as well. And then more werewolf stories. More werewolf stories, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everyone else, thank you for joining us as well. Um, keep an eye out. We'll have a recording of this on our website in a day or so. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well. And our website is just nywolf.org, so newyorkwolf.org. And, uh, and you can check out um, other wolves, our 33 wolves that call our place home. All right, yeah. so thank you. Get some sleep, Craig. And yeah. we'll see you next time. See you later, Bye, guys. Everyone.